Here I am, back after three months away, again, with another worst YouTubers video because, as it turns out, a lot of the people who use this website are deplorable, reprehensible, and sometimes just downright evil. Looking back on my first worst YouTubers video, it's hard to believe that I started with JStation and Onision, because everyone I've covered since has just been so much worse than them, and this video will of course be no exception. In fact, I'd say this one has the worst YouTubers yet. So let's stop wasting time and get right into the video. Here are 9 more of the worst YouTubers. You know what, I, I want you all to look at me. I want you all to look at me. I want you to... Because what I'm about to say is, is important. I think I've been thinking about this a lot a lot lately and I want y'all to know this this goes out to everybody you're not stupid okay you're not stupid don't ever tell yourself that you are you're important what you have in your head may not mean a lot to a lot of people but what's what makes you special you are important you mean something and you're going to go out there and you're going to do some wonderful things but first and foremost you're not stupid you're not an idiot don't ever tell yourself that you are and if nobody else ever tells you this, I will tell you this. I care about you. The Jew Wario YouTube channel was created on December 28th, 2006, with the very first upload being titled Pop and Mania Controller, often reviewing games or gaming related tech. The channel would also cover reviews of various candy from other countries, as well as opinions on comic cons and monologues to camera. The channel would end up making a total of 228 videos, but it was with another group that Jew Wario would gain a lot more notoriety. The man behind Jew Wario was Justin Carmichael, born April 11, 1971 in Colorado Springs, USA. With his channel doing well, he was invited to join Channel Awesome, then known as ThatGuyWithTheGlasses.com specifically under the blistered thumb subsection, which focused mainly on video games and related content. His You Can Play This series did well, where he reviewed and commented on lesser known games. There was a focus on Japanese games that were a little more obscure and would otherwise not see much mainstream attention. In addition, his series known as The Gaming Pipeline was a more general show where over the course of 35 episodes, Ju Wario would discuss any related gaming news open fan mail and answer it, or just discuss upcoming events where he would be attending, such as E3. Less regular, but still popular episodes were called J-Dub Reviews, where he would give viewers an oversight of an obscure game, controller, or system. Blistered Thumbs also produced Play Proceeds Clockwise, where Ju Wario focused on tabletop games, although this was only for a single episode. The Stuck In Your Head series was a simple five episode effort where people would sing along to theme songs such as DuckTales or Danger Mouse and would conclude with, quote, now it's stuck in your head. Jew Warrior would also occasionally play a character he created called Yankee J, a gangster complete with baseball bat, who would review more violent games that Justin himself apparently didn't want to. Between these many series and videos, Jew Warrior was a frequent contributor and member of the collective. Alongside him were some of the more well-known creators such as Angry Joe, Spoonie, and Guru Larry. Justin announced his departure from the group in February 2013, moving on with seemingly no ill feelings or issues afoot. A year after this, on January 23rd, 2014, Justin would take his own life via self-inflicted gunshot with a shotgun. His wife confirmed the news on social media, saying that he'd been struggling both financially and with his mental health at the time. Blistered Thumbs had officially shut down nine days earlier. Many of the Channel Awesome members, past and present, most notably Doug Walker and Angry Joe, would upload tribute videos to Justin, saying what a great and kind-hearted person he was and how much he would be missed. This is something that has raised a lot of confusion and a lot of questions because anyone who knew Justin knew this didn't seem in character with him. It simply 
didn't make sense to us because the Justin that we came across and we remembered was always positive. He was always upbeat. He was always talkative. Even if you were in a bad mood or you were in an awkward situation or something wasn't comfortable, he would always start talking. He would always try to cheer you up and try to make you feel better. And I think the reason that Justin is really something special is because despite knowing what we know now, we will still remember him as this upbeat, cheerful, positive, wonderful human being. And that's because he has shared so much of that positivity with us. He has shared so much goodness with us. So this is a collection of, certainly not all, but many times that he has gone out of his way to make us feel better, to entertain, to make us laugh, and just share so much with us. Uh, so to you, Justin, just thank you so much for sharing so much with us. Someone who, uh, who I know and who was really nice, really nice to me and uh, one of the most gentle, kind people that you will ever know or meet in your life. I'm talking about Juario, Justin Carmichael. I will, I probably will never have, I probably will never have the words uh, to describe the type of person that Justin was to everybody around him. He was the nicest, gentlest, kindest soul. Uh, a lot of people say that about him. It's the first thing you're going to hear every single time from anybody that you talk to who has met Justin. The words kind, gentle, and, and he was. More so than anybody I've ever met. And it's difficult to put into words. He would listen to you so intently. And you can tell in his eyes that he had actual love and care for what you said. And he would take the time. It doesn't matter how long it took. Uh, to, to listen to what was going on and offer you advice. Uh, you know, that he genuinely cared about other people. He cared about feelings and, and, and all of that stuff. He was, uh, he was in tune to it. I never knew that Justin was going through. It must have been a storm or a battle internally. I never knew that. He was always so happy, always uh, smiling, dancing, and that's how I remember Justin and how I will always remember him. Fellow Channel Awesome alumni, Linkara, Spoonie, and Bennett the Sage also had a Wario hat on display to pay tribute to their deceased friend and colleague. As you can see, Justin was very well loved and respected among his fellow creators. Little did they know that their opinions of him would one day change completely. It would be nearly five years later when a document was released that would cast not only Justin, but other members of Channel Awesome in a poor light. In it, multiple people associated with the channel and its subsidiaries over the years laid out many complaints against the people high up in the organization. As part of the document, there were chat logs leaked that showed a member of the team complaining about being sexually harassed by someone within the company. While they agreed to fire the perpetrator due to the incomplete censorship efforts, readers were able to deduce the following. The chat logs agreed that the offender would be fired on Friday, February 15th, 2013. And it didn't take much for internet users to put together that this timing matched exactly with when Justin left the group. So it became obvious that he had been fired for sexual misconduct rather than leaving of his own free will. There were also parts of the logs that seemed to hint that those higher up in the company had been aware of reports about Justin prior to this final complaint, but had entirely failed to do anything about it. In 2018, a Reddit user added more fuel to the fire when they reported that they had been assaulted while they were sleeping by Justin also. By the time either of these things came to light, Justin had been dead for several years, and as such, no one involved would be able to get justice. His reputation and his legacy, however, were forever tarnished in the public eye. All the creators who made tribute videos to him quickly removed said videos after these revelations about Justin. Any of them who actually collaborated with him on videos even went as far as to edit him out of them, and then Kara, Spoonie, and Bennett the Sage removed his Wario hat from their backgrounds. The only former Channel Awesome member to address the details about Justin was Mars Girl, who seemed to have been his closest friend on the site. She uploaded a 28 minute video in which she talks about how shocked and horrified that the man she saw as a loving man and a dear friend 
was in fact a sexual predator. Boy, is, is this a difficult pill to swallow uh, because it has been publicly revealed thanks to Channel Awesome and their response uh, that Jew Wario uh, was a sexual predator. Justin's name hadn't come up at all. Uh, that wasn't part of the discussion. Uh, and then another former contributor said, hey, do you think we should bring up that they knew about a sexual predator and didn't do anything? And a, a good hunk of us were like, oh, we don't really know what you're talking about. Uh, we don't know who this was. And uh, that particular producer said, well, uh, it was Justin. Um, I was just floored. I, I don't know what else to say. And this, this was so sad to me. Uh, and I felt like as this was coming to light and as a lot of people were coming to, to realize this, uh, here I am realizing how much I worked with Justin and how much work I did for him and in his name, uh, how I ran Facebook charities uh, for suicide prevention and uh, so many other people went on charity walks for suicide prevention and stuff in Justin's name and now it just feels like what was it all for? Did it, did it mean nothing? Maybe it meant nothing. I don't know. Uh, we came to the decision that because now we were also learning that there were possibly multiple victims of Justin's and just I can't believe this was even my friend I, I just couldn't even believe it and so we said okay um, we won't include Justin's name and it especially was a decision that we made because obviously Justin's not here to hurt anyone ever again even more tragic is that Justin's widow had to find out what kind of man her late husband was through reading everything about him on the internet, which must have been truly earth-shattering for her. It just goes to show that even creators who appear kind-hearted and friendly on the outside can be hiding a truly horrifying secret, and in this case, we found out long after Justin escaped any consequences for his disgusting actions. The YouTube channel Plasma Master Don was created on August 17th, 2012, and in the eight years leading up to its closure in November 2020, they posted more than two and a half thousand videos. The very first of these was less than a minute long and simply titled New YouTube Account. In it, Don explains why he has started this new channel. His previous account, known as Plasma Dude 47, that he had opened in 2006, had been hacked and closed, and he could no longer access it, as well as his second, Plasma Don 1947. This very brief and informal video sets the format for most of the rest of the contents that he will go on to make. His most popular uploads would be of this elderly man filming himself recording either songs or raps to the camera, usually as a user request. In between these sorts of videos, there were occasionally shots of his beloved pet dog, Penny, and local sites of interest when he was out and about. They were all extremely casual, entirely inoffensive, and it has to be said, oddly charming. There was a sincerity and basic decency to the channel that seemed to flow from everything he recorded. The man behind the channel was called Donzel Edward Owens Jr., and he'd been born on September 10th, 1947 in Ohio. This year of birth might be why people began to gradually drift towards Don's channel and stick around. Regular uploads from a man who was at least in his mid-sixties when the Plasma Master Don channel started. The Plasma reference in most of his chosen usernames is from his previous occupation where he worked as a plasma cutter for a company in his home state of Ohio. In terms of his life outside of YouTube, the information he gave out over the course of the years that he was making videos was the names of his three siblings, his parents, who were both deceased, and his high school. Slow and Steady seemed to be the name of the game when it came to channel growth as it reached the 100,000 subscriber mark in June of 2020, eight years after starting. An impressive feat, no doubt, and the milestones just kept coming after that. The very next month, Plasma Master Don passed 200,000, and then 300,000 in August, and 400,000 in September. 
The channel broke the half a million sub barrier in late November 2020, and while this is an impressive feat by any measure, Dom was soon to realize that with increased exposure comes increased scrutiny. In his case, this would be in the form of a fairly innocuous Reddit post that was created in the R Morbid Reality subreddit and would be brought to the public at large via a YouTube video courtesy of Nick Crowley that went live on December 11, 2020. When the original post went up, Plasma Master Dom posted less than a week later to state that he was taking some time away from YouTube. He was now into his 70s and his COPD and health in general was stopping him being able to sing. The timing of this announcement, almost immediately after the accusatory post went up, made most people suspicious that he was merely trying to swerve the subject. The video by Nick Crowley in December went over the now-deleted post where a user had made a worrying discovery. In the state of Ohio, the sex offenders register is accessible to the public and someone had made a strange connection. There was an entry in it that seemed to match some of the known facts of Plasma Master Dom a little too clearly. And this entry in the register was a man who had been charged with groping a young boy. The first and most obvious was the name, Donzel Edward Owens. This makes a fairly strong case already, as it seems highly unlikely to have two men with the exact same combination of first, middle and surname, all in the same order, and living in the state of Ohio. The second is the date of birth given for both men, being September 10th, 1947. The year Don was born was never in doubt, due to 47 being included in his username, but the birthday he had provided in his YouTube About section matched exactly. The likelihood of these two very specific pieces of personal information applying to two men within a single state is already astronomically slim. Just over 5.5 million males live in Ohio. How probable is it that two entirely separate men exist that share the exact same birthday and have identical names? While this seemed more than enough to prove the point, further details were examined. The vehicle that was cited in the register was a 2005 Buick Sentry, and Plasma Master Don featured a video on his channel on November 15, 2015 entitled My Car 2005 Buick Sentry, where he gave a brief overview of this vehicle. There are other similarities in terms of eye and hair color matching, as well as both men wearing glasses. Some even pointed out that the mugshot attached to the register had a shirt that Plasma Master Don owned in it. But these facts made it fairly likely that these men were one and the same. As soon as he had announced his time away from YouTube for health reasons, it became apparent that he was attempting some light censorship to try and keep the issue hidden. There were reports of deleted comments and banned users whenever the incident was referred to. As it would happen, Plasma Master Dom would upload his last ever video on November 18th, mere weeks before the video exposing him would be released. And while many believed his quote, health troubles, were employed to avoid the heat from being outed, there was clearly some truth to them, as Plasma Master Don, or Donzel Edward Owens, passed away on December 21st, 2020. While the evidence for him being one and the same as the man accused of sexual misconduct in his state is near overwhelming, it needs to be noted that he had never confirmed it before his passing. However, his legacy, and how he has been viewed by many since these revelations, has surely tainted what was sure to have been a great legacy. Carl Philip Herold was an American programmer born in 1981. Prior to becoming well known, he'd apparently been a programmer for over 15 years, and in 2009, under the Reddit name Carl H., he would post the r slash programming subreddit, where he would offer to teach anyone who wanted to be a programmer themselves, completely free of charge. He said that this was, quote, just him being nice, and hopefully helping someone out. Though he did say he could only take on so many students. He apparently received hundreds of requests following this post, and while he was thrilled to see so many people interested in learning from him, it was obviously far too many people for him to teach on his own. Another user named Mosky replied to the post and recommended that Carl created his own subreddit and use it as a sort of classroom, where he could post his own tutorials and give assignments to those who read them, where they'd come back and show what they'd learned from him. Two days after this original post, Carl did make his own subreddit called r slash Carl H Programming, which quickly drew to have thousands of members over the next three years. The success of this sub led to him to create his own YouTube channel on July 7th, 2012. Carl's videos were, of course, all tutorials related to programming, most of them actually screen recordings from private lessons. He comes across as very cheerful and happy to be helping so many aspiring programmers, 
Keep in mind he was doing this all for free, so it really did seem like he just loved his job and wanted to share his knowledge with as many people as possible, never wanting anything in return. His students obviously thought very highly of him, and Carl was known for being very nice and approachable. All in all, Carl really did come across as an all-around selfless individual. His students admired him so much that when he posted a story on Reddit about how he was scammed by a marketing agent who tried to swindle him and his company out of thousands of dollars in 2005, his students rallied behind him, leaving positive comments on the Reddit post and upvoting it so that it became the first thing that came up when Carl's name was searched on Google. Thanks to his followers, the Reddit post became the first search result, pushing any negative mentions of him down. On July 26, 2012, three weeks after creating his YouTube channel, Carl was named Redditor of the Day. He did an Ask Me Anything on the same day, which was filled with his students posting positive comments about him, with Carl showing genuine gratitude to all of them, clearly thrilled that he'd helped so many people. By all accounts, Carl was a saint who everyone had nothing but good things to say about. Unfortunately, Carl was not the good person he made himself out to be. His fans would soon learn what kind of man Carl Herald really was. In 2013, without warning, Carl suddenly stopped being active on Reddit and YouTube. Naturally, his students were surprised and concerned about his whereabouts since it was unlike him to be gone for extended periods of time like this. And then, Carl Harold's name appeared in the news. Carl and his partner, Charles Dunavant, were arrested and charged with making child of Carl's own son and posted videos of the abuse online. He also prevented his son from going to school and going outside and threatened to kill him if he told anyone about the abuse. When the police raided his home, they found over 100 images of Carl's son. Because of the incident, he was judged and then incarcerated for sodomy, sexual abuse, aggravated child abuse, child production, and disturbing child He and Dunavant's bails were set to $1 billion. Naturally, the Reddit community was shocked and appalled that the man who they had looked up to and viewed as a generous and wholesome mentor was in fact a vile and disgusting predator who had done unspeakable things to his own son. Everyone who had once admired and supported him were now understandably outraged and condemned him for his diabolical and disgusting actions. In 2014, he was found hanged in his Alabama jail cell, having, quote, unalived himself to avoid trial and sentencing. Carl really pulled the wool over the eyes of his followers. He convinced him all that he was a selfless man who wanted to help and educate others, when in reality, he was an evil scumbag who committed unforgivable acts on his own son, no doubt scarring the poor child for life. Vote Saxon 07 is a YouTube channel started in October of 2015 that focused on all things unapologetically nerdy. Over the next 8 years, there would be more than 650 videos posted to the channel, with a lot of the videos covering Doctor Who, both as a show and the memorabilia that surrounded it. Later it would expand to take in reviews and overviews of other franchises and the associated toys, gadgets and collectibles that could be gotten from them. Pokemon, Robot Wars, Toy Story, Star Wars, if it has a dedicated fan base and any amount of either current or nostalgic memorabilia, then it was fair game on the channel and it did well, ballooning up to a subscriber count of above 36,000. This was actually the second channel created by Stephen McCullough. His first foray into the world of YouTube started five years earlier, where he reviewed a Doctor Who toy, the Sonic Screwdriver. This would demonstrate not only what the Vote Saxon channel would eventually become, but even showed how he came up with the name. Vote Saxon is a reference to a campaign within the world of Doctor Who, where the, quote, Saxon Master appears and succeeds in becoming the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Stephen himself was born in February 1990 in Northern Ireland to parents Heather and John. Outside of YouTube, he contributed to the Belfast Telegraph newspaper as an online content editor and to the Nerd News website. Both of his parents would pass away, with Heather dying in 2014 and John a year later in 2015. His love of Robot Wars, the UK television show where robots designed and piloted by enthusiasts compete against each other in a battle of destruction, was obvious when he became a member of the team known as Aztec. They entered various robots over the course of multiple series, including Push to Exit. This was the team's entry in series 9 and 10, where McCullough was part of the crew as quote, media relations, covering their progress and shooting behind the scenes footage. The idea was that he would review the robot and help build hype by posting the videos to his channel. Despite some promising efforts, 
had never made a cut in the series, being immobilized and eliminated both times. Despite achieving reasonable success on YouTube, events would unfold in real life that would make him more famous and well known than he would ever hoped or expected. On December 18th, 2022, Natalie McConnelly was stabbed to death inside her Belfast home. At the time, 32-year-old Natalie was an estimated 15 weeks pregnant with Stephen's child. The brutal murder made headlines locally and led to law enforcement looking for the culprit and suspicion initially fell on Stephen as the two had been in a relationship at the time. Despite being arrested in January of 2023, Stephen would produce what looked like an airtight alibi. On the night in question, Stephen had been streaming himself playing Grand Theft Auto for six hours during the time frame when the murder took place. Following this revelation, he was promptly de-arrested. However, other pieces of evidence soon led to the police looking closer at his stream. Firstly, there was CCTV footage obtained that showed a man taking a bus from where Stephen lived to Natalie's home, all the while taking great care to conceal his face. This man had a bag with him and was wearing gloves. After they got off the bus, they headed off in the direction of Natalie's home before reappearing 40 minutes later with entirely different clothes on. At this point, they hailed a taxi, which dropped them off near to where Stephen lived. When the police looked into the alibi stream a little more closely, they noted a few suspicious aspects to it. The first was that he had a note on the stream saying that there were issues with the setup and he wouldn't be interacting with any of the viewers because of this. While this is possible, it seemed a little too convenient that there was no quote live reactions or interactions with viewers to ever prove he was sitting behind the computer at the time. So the police investigated further. The six hour stream was determined to have been pre-recorded within the week previous in what law enforcement described as a deliberate attempt to create an alibi. Stephen eventually admitted that the live stream was in fact not live but denied it was done with any ulterior motives. He claimed he wasn't streaming that night, he had actually been drinking and fell asleep. He remains in custody, charged with the murder of Natalie. Stephen is yet another YouTuber who might have found great success on the site and become a well-known and respected content creator. Instead, people will now only think of him as the monster who murdered his girlfriend and their unborn child. Devin Michael Erickson was born on September 20th, 2000, in Colorado, USA. It doesn't seem as though he had a particularly happy childhood, with numerous reports of issues in his home life. While there seems to be a lack of specifics with regards to it, there was an outlet that Devin found, and that was the internet, including YouTube. He started the channel Not So Fantastic Devon on January 8, 2016. His output wasn't either prolific or memorable. In fact, by the time the channel was deactivated in 2019, he had posted a grand total of three videos. For reasons that will soon become obvious, all the videos on his channel had been wiped from the internet. From what we understand, the sparse videos focused on the game Dead by Daylight. However, outside of the internet is where Devon gained the most fame. He was attending Highlands Ranch STEM school alongside his friend, Alec McKinney. Alec was born female, but was transitioning to male and identified as he slash him. He was also 16 at the time, and as such, there were little to no information, images or details available about him to the public at large. Devon, however, was 18. The two of them were clearly very close. Devon featured in Alec's Instagram profile picture, and the pair had long been known to have a good relationship. They were both a little disillusioned, unhappy, and not fond of the students that surrounded them at their place of education. Later reports would come out that there was some suspicious or worrying edits made to the Wikipedia page of the school. Someone had added information regarding a program that had recently run to support people struggling with mental health in order to mitigate against both self-harm and school shootings. An anonymous edit was made from an IP in the area that simply added, do they work? We shall see. Both Alec and Devon were known to be struggling with their mental health issues at this point, but the actions they choose to take were far beyond what anyone could have thought. The two of them ducked out during lunch break and went to Devon's home. According to his later testimony, Devon says that Alex forced him to open the gun safe and the pair then took two actions. The first was to arm themselves with multiple firearms, including handguns and a rifle, which they concealed in a backpack and inside a guitar case. The second was that they took some cocaine. After this, 
they returned to the school and made their way inside. Devin would later claim he intended on reporting Alec and that he had no guns on him, but instead, the two met up and came into a classroom from two different directions. The guns were produced and they opened fire. A classmate by the name of Kendra Castillo, himself only aged 18, lost his life when he charged at Devon in an attempt to protect his classmates and disarm him. Two other students also jumped at the gunmen and successfully disarmed and subdued him. This would end up being the only fatality of the incident, although eight additional people suffered gunshot wounds. Alec would later state he intended to take his own life during the shooting, but was thwarted by the safety mechanism on his handgun. Instead, he was apprehended and subdued on the scene and taken into custody. Once the pair went to trial, and all the ins and outs were ironed out legally, the man behind the channel Not So Fantastic Devon was found guilty on 46 different counts and received a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. And just in case anyone was worried that he'd gotten off lightly, they added 1,282 and a half years on top of that. That's not a typo by the way, that is the exact amount of additional years that were added onto the sentence. The convictions included murder, 31 counts of attempted murder, arson, burglary, and conspiracy among others. It's safe to say that Devon's channel will not be seeing any significant updates in any of our lifetimes. When it comes to the YouTuber known as Vance Stone, the question isn't what he had on his channel, what he uploaded, what he spoke about, what he was into, it's more which channel are we really talking about because it would turn out that the man behind the Vance Stone YouTube name had run a number of different channels over the years, with varying degrees of success, infamy, and irrelevance. If we go all the way back to the very inception of Vance Stone, then we'll find a channel named The Orange Block. That was created in November 2008, but posted a grand total of zero videos. The very next channel is where we take the name from, Vance Stone, which was launched on August 30th, 2009, and ended up posting 22 videos. The important thing to realize from this point, and going forward, is that there is no real rhyme or reason to either the names, the purposes, or the success of these channels. While some have been tailored towards niche interests or targeted towards specific audiences, the general theme that overrides it all is a concept of shitposting. It seems to be any content under any username and targeted at any audience as long as it would elicit an interaction and a response, even if that response was negative. That becomes fundamental to what this creator was all about. There was no tells of who they were as a person, what their beliefs were or how they felt, just inflammatory content for the sake of engagement. Some of it even wandered into the realms of rage baiting. Take for example the channel Cho Sung Hui 4.0, named after the infamous spree killer of Virginia Tech which not only had the killer's face as the profile picture, but managed to upload more than 30 videos from its creation in August 2017. There could be no other explanation for taking the name and likeness of a mass murderer and slapping it on a new channel other than to elicit a hostile response. Yet this seems to be what the man behind Van Stone was all about. He created Baldo McF*** in November of 2015 and managed to upload more than 30 videos without being banned as well as a series of nearly 10 other channels. The objective, in retrospect, was clear. Offend, push buttons, and see how people react. While the various channels really ran the gauntlet for some legitimate attempts at making gaming content to the mainly shitposting channels, when we peek behind the curtain to look at the man behind the many, many channels, we may start to understand what it was all about. The man at the keyboard and the business end of the upload machine was William Edward Atchison. He was born on March 18, 1996, in Belen, New Mexico. Along with his brother and parents, they moved to Aztec, a nearby town where he attended high school. His experience in school and his actions both paint a twin picture of an outcast who was forced further out towards the extremes of life. It's fairly accepted that he was fairly heavily bullied and never got on well with his peers. Here the local police called on him a number of times. It's said that he was in counselling within the school for a number of years and also had the police visit him at home after he allegedly opened fire on neighbors' pets with air rifles. He ended up being kicked out of his high school when he chose to try to make a memorial for the Columbine shooters on the classroom whiteboard in 2012, which was met with obvious backlash from his classmates. He would never return to schooling after this incident, and instead sought work locally. By this point, he was already posting prolifically online, and being very open about his opinions regarding where he lived, and his long-term prospects. His online presence would go from unhinged to blatantly dangerous as he would post on right-wing forums, 
use inflammatory usernames such as Adam Lanza and express a continuous and targeted interest in past school shooters and what they had, quote, accomplished. When another similarly minded individual named David Solomby committed the Munich shootings in 2016, authorities would realize that the two had been in close contact and began to monitor William even closer. In March of 2016, the FBI would contact him to inquire about his posts and seem to ask about his acquisition of a weapon for committing a mass shooting. Somehow, given the vast and random nature of his internet presence up until this point, he was able to convince them that he was simply trolling or trying to get a reaction for effect. The letter agency confirmed for themselves that he owned no actual firearms and then dropped the case. In late 2017, William would purchase a 9mm Glock 19 semi-auto pistol entirely legally from Farmington in San Juan County, New Mexico. After the fact, it came out that he revisited the high school in Aztec under what could only be assumed to be a false front and was given a guided tour. During this tour, he marked out all the exits, the entrances and all possibilities relevant to the plan he was building. At 8am on December 7, 2017, William entered the high school at Aztec, pretending to be a student. Once he was inside the upper hallway, he opened fire with the weapon he had purchased in San Juan. Thomas Hill, the janitor, chased after him, shouting, Shooter, to draw attention. Additionally, Katie Porter, a substitute in her 70s, directed students into a classroom and barricaded the door with furniture. The immediate and swift actions of these two staff members undoubtedly saved a great number of lives that day. When the dust settled, two students had lost their lives. Casey Jordan Masquez and Francisco Fernandez had both suffered fatal wounds from William's rampage. William then of course did what most school shooters did to avoid being captured. In a note, some detail of his reasoning for the shooting is given. Work sucks. School sucks. Life sucks. I just went out of this shit. Once again, like so many who came before him, William was just another lunatic who felt that everyone else was to blame for his problems and that they needed to pay. No one will ever remember him for whatever content he uploaded to YouTube. Instead, he'll always be remembered as a cold-blooded killer who murdered two innocent people at his old high school. George Alfred Sodini was a man who was successful in a lot of ways by any standard. He worked as a computer programmer and made good money while maintaining a nice home in Pennsylvania. But as would be made clear from the two very sparse and lonely videos that he posted on his YouTube channel, he was seemingly not very well equipped to handle life like most of the human race was. Two videos survive on his channel, MOSB46PGH, with each of them demonstrating his difficulty in functioning within the world fairly well. The first, uploaded 15 years ago, describes the best course of action to hide from emotion a tutorial in which he describes that he has spent the vast majority of his adult life being unable to obtain any sort of personal closeness or intimate relationships. His first effort into the cyber realm was just him explaining how isolated and lonely he felt and advising others how they could do the same. It is easy for me to hide from my emotions for one more day. Take a long drive in the car, listen to some music, daydream, or just do some mundane task around the house that really doesn't need to be done, that's, that's not too important. And there you go, one more day, and one more day turns into one more year. Now, um, RDS says that I have approximately maybe 15 more years to be successful at this. And when I heard that, I wanted to continue immediately to, to start moving on this. I didn't realize I had that much time. So, but my objective is to be real and to learn to be emotional and to, you know, to be able to emotionally connect with people. Because when I'm 10 to 20 years older than she is, you know, she has to feel good about this thing. And the only way to, around that, you know, is, is to work on this and perhaps STEM exercises or, or forgiveness exercises as per hey or, or whatever else. I'm going to post this and see what comes back. The second is a house tour where he shows the viewers exactly where he lived and how his life and his house was set up. The property in question is impressive, there are plenty of trappings of a successful life that we would all agree with, but the undertones of being lonely and detached from any sort of meaningful relationship shine through. This is clearly a man who has managed to start a successful career, one who has enough money to sustain a fairly solid home life, but one who is chronically lonely. 
a man who feels like he has done everything right according to the blueprint of life, but remains entirely by himself and seems entirely unable to remedy the situation in any way. His feelings of isolation and inadequacy are amplified in this video that remains up and visible to this day. This is my house from the street. Here is my car. This is a two bedroom brick ranch, conveniently located. My car is an 07 Ultima. I paid 79,000 for this in 1996. That's considered a lot, believe it or not. Open it up. Oh, someone left it unlocked. That's not good. Inside, okay, is my big screen TV, 32 inch. It's my computer. Let me pan out a little bit. Computer is connected to the stereo, which I listen to my MP3s and everything else. Pan to the other side. Speakers on each side are large. They double as end tables. <laughs> Okay, couch and chair, they match. The woman will be really be impressed. <laughs> okay, come over here. There's some reading material that we're all familiar with. Come out here through the dining room. I just bought this. Uh, dining room set. Rug, okay. Little hallway, two bedrooms. Two bedrooms. To the right is my bedroom. Extra computer here, they're networked. I'll show you the Cat5 connections downstairs. Okay, there's, it looks pretty clean. I'm sure she'll be impressed. It's nothing more than a house tour, but there is an undertone of sadness imbued within it that is hard to ignore. There is nothing malicious or deadly or worrying at all in George's house tour. In fact, most viewers report feeling a bit sorry for him. It's as though he was a man who never understood the game plan for life. Following it anyway, and then found out that the rewards promise were nothing but a pipe dream. But before you start feeling too much sympathy for George, we need to move on to the reason that he's on this list. He bottled up these feelings of isolation, loneliness, frustration, and that life had cheated him somehow, and chose to resolve it in the most brutal way possible. On October 24th, 2009, George headed along to his local LA fitness gym, except this time, he brought a duffel bag with him, one that was filled with an arsenal of weapons, two Glock semi-auto pistols, and a 32 caliber and 45 caliber handgun. He arrived at the location, at a point where it was filled with mainly women, and turned off the lights before opening up his bag of armaments. Later, evidence would be found on his blog and in his home that he spoke of his intentions when he came to this day. He spoke about what he wanted to do and how he couldn't bail on it under any circumstances. These notes seemed to imply that he was intent on committing this outrage and there was nothing that was ever going to stop him. The notes he left referred to an quote, exit plan, heavily implying that he would quote, unalive himself in the process, as well as the fact that he had planned something earlier in the year that he had backed out of at the last minute. His personal website was full of his frustrated venting about the fact that he was alone and his lack of success with women. A direct quote is, last time I slept all night with a girlfriend, it was 1982. Girls and women don't even give me a second look anywhere, amongst many other posts with similar themes. In the darkness of the women's aerobics class, he opened fire indiscriminately. Once he had nearly run out of ammunition, he turned the gun on himself, marking himself as the final fatality in the shooting. The end result was that nine people were injured in the course of his rampage, as well as three lives being taken, all women. The only other life that was lost was that of George himself. Again, it would be very easy to feel sorry for George, seeing as how he made a habit out of telling everyone how lonely and unsuccessful with women he was. But it can't be stated enough how little he deserves any sympathy because he killed three innocent people or because he let his feelings of loneliness consume him. And instead of trying harder to better himself as a person, he took it out on the world in the most gruesome way possible. I just don't have any willpower to do anything anymore. You know, I know a lot of people say, oh, that's weak minded, that's pathetic, but dude, it's, it's like how many years I've been working out, how many years I've been wanting and dealing with all these frustrations. You know, it's, it's like I was, just, I was doing a session the other, just now. I was thinking, what, what, am, I, what am I doing this for? Why do I? 
what the f you know how many how long have I been doing this for? Has it changed my life? No. Do I feel any better anymore? No. Do I get any enjoyment from working out anymore? No. Do I get any good feeling after, you know, that natural high anymore? No. I'm so beaten down and defeated by f***ing life. That drive that I once had, that's gone, man. It's gone. It's literally gone. Like, I, I don't have the power anymore. I don't have that willpower anymore. I can't sit there and, 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 and force myself to be like, right, let's do this. You know, we we'll work towards, we we'll keep going, yes. You know, muscle through it, you know, like, I, I just can't do that anymore. When, when you dealt with nothing but negativity in your life, you know, you can't, it's, it's, as you get older and you just, you get ground down, you just, you know, I try and I, I, and I always keep trying, but it's, it's like, I'm at the point now where it's like, why do I even bother? Like, for what? You know? I'm still in the same house, same situation, same position. Still, everything's still the same. People look like me, and I'm not making excuses, but this is just the reality. People look like me have had nobody but themselves, and people who are incels and all this. I'm not. I'm clarifying myself as an incel, but you know, people like similar to me. They've had nothing but themselves. And then they've socially had it tough. When you've been defeated a million times, it's you wake up and you're like, well, what the f You know, when, you've, when you work so f hard, so f hard, and you see motherfuckers at work nowhere near as hard as you. And then you wake up and you stare at the wall and you're thinking, oh, nothing's changed. Like I'm still in the same position, same period in life. Still a f this, that, virgin fat, ugly, whatever you want to call it, you know, what most people would have been completely, utterly broken if they had lived, you know, my, my fucking life, and I know that for a fact, and I'm not trying to say, like, pity party or I'm the biggest victim in the world, but I know for a fact if people would live my fucking life, they wouldn't have lasted. Jake William Davison was born on August 21st, 1998, to Mark and Maxine Davison in Plymouth, England. They previously lived in the Shetland Islands, north of mainland Scotland, where Mark worked as a fisherman and Maxine had spent time on trawlers. Jake's childhood, however, would not be a straightforward one. His parents were separated, Jake's two older siblings lived in the Shetlands while he and his mother were in England, and his father had some trouble with the law. Mark Davison had been fined for using racist language to insult a fellow bus passenger in 2010, and four years later, received an eight-month sentence for punching and biting the cheek of a fellow crewman on board a fishing vessel. Despite this, Jake spent significant periods of time back up north with other members of Maxine's family that still lived in the islands, as well as his older siblings. When he was still a child, Jake was diagnosed with both ADHD and autism, two conditions that made him feel like he couldn't fit in and led him to struggling to make friends. Two passions seemed to be his way to try and find semblance of normality, the internet and firearms. Jake started a YouTube channel under the name Professor Waffle, and started spending long hours browsing and posting on various forums. The difficulty that he felt in his day-to-day -day life, the problems that he felt he faced attracting women or beginning meaningful friendships, all of a sudden, instead of being this one unique, baffling and infuriating part of his existence, he found many others who felt like he did. He occasionally posted in incel forums, involuntary celibates or people who aren't having any sex and believe that this is an issue that society as a whole should remedy, rather than any sort of personal introspection or improvement. The fairly bleak outlook he had obtained on life by this point became pretty obvious. His posts would later be described as both misogynistic and hate-filled. There were frequent references to his general nihilism when it came to how he viewed his life as well as numerous concepts such as the black pill outlook, a general belief that life is essentially pointless and all human effort is wasted. Jake felt that his lack of success with women was down to their own failings and their personal leanings. He believed, as many others did in these small pockets of the internet, that these women were passing over good guys like him in favour of quote, chads or conventionally attractive men 
that simply had sex with and then discarded females that were charmed by their surface level attraction. Another theme in his videos as he posted were aspects of self-improvement. Jake began to lift weights and recorded not only his body development but also his own ever-increasing personal bests. However, despite this objectively improving his own health and self-worth, when it did nothing to improve his romantic opportunities, it only pushed him further down the rabbit hole. Outside of the online world, his mother Maxine was recognizing the struggles that her son was going through. Despite the fact that he was working at Babcock locally, she could see that his mental health, which had long been an issue for him, was not improving. She contacted local services multiple times, looking for some assistance with how to best handle and help her son. In fact, his mental instability had already brought him some trouble. On one of the trips back to the islands up north, he had gotten into an altercation with locals, which resulted in minor trouble. A second incident back when he lived in Plymouth led to him having his firearms license temporarily revoked. At this point, his estranged father even contacted the local police to express his concern about the issue. It was his opinion that Jake was not stable enough to hold the license he held and asked for it not to be reinstated. Mark Davison said he never received a response. As it happened, the local police chose to reinstate his license and gave his guns back to him. That would come with tragic circumstances on August 12, 2021. All the unhappiness, the dissatisfaction, and the frustration that had plagued Jake Davidson's life up until this point would come to a senseless and violent conclusion. Just after 6pm, Jake got into yet another fight with his mother. This time, however, he grabbed her by her throat, wouldn't let her leave the room, and subsequently shot her with his pump-action shotgun. Maxine had phoned her sister at the start of the altercation, meaning that the police were already notified by this point. With his mother dead, and Jake clearly having lost his grip on reality, he left the house still holding the same shotgun. A near neighbor in the street, a 43-year-old man, became his next victim by being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Alongside him, his three-year-old daughter was also shot by Jake. He injured two other close neighbors by firing through their windows, thankfully not killing either but continued on his route to a local park, where he managed to take another life by killing a man in his late 50s. Another woman in her 60s met her end at the hands of Jake's shotgun while she was leaving a hairdresser's before he eventually turned the weapon on himself, just as the police started to arrive and close in on him. Although he is largely known as an incel killer, Jake Davison was more misogynistic and black-pilled. One of Maxine's previous partners described Jake as taking multiple protein supplements and energy drinks a day, as well as claiming that he took anabolic steroids. His many arguments with his mother were because he seemed to view females as beneath him in some way. It was some combination of his hateful worldview, seemingly endlessly reinforced by the way his life was going, and a genuine belief that there was no way for it to ever get any better, that sent him down this dark path. The YouTube channel Wumscut86 was created on March 14th, 2008. After posting only around 5 videos, the channel would be shut down that very same year towards the end of September. While the normal format is to go over the channel and then review the person behind it, it seems once again that it would make more sense to look into the man behind the channel before we look at what sorts of content he was producing. Marty Johani Sari, the man behind the camera, was a Finnish national born on March 20th, 1986. As with most people on this list, Marti had not been blessed with a straightforward childhood. In his younger years, he suffered from ill health. His childhood was marred with reoccurring bouts of illness, slow physical development, and reported bullying from his peers due to these things. He found it hard to fit in, and nothing that happened in the course of his life seemed to make that any better. He lost his older brother at the age of 17, and seemed to retreat even further, if that was possible, into himself. As he approached his later teens, Marty was struggling with numerous mental health conditions, including, but not limited to, anxiety, depression, schizotypal personality disorder, and avoidant personality disorder. To add to the mix, Marty was promptly kicked out of the Finnish army after having been a part of it for less than a month. He joined in 2006 at the age of 20, but it would not take long for him to cause issues. When they were on an exercise, he opened fire without permission and was promptly kicked out. According to those that knew him, and those that treated him for his mental health, he was obsessed with the Columbine shooters, firearms in general, and at one point admitted to a friend that he wanted to, quote, kill as many people as possible. It was under this alarmingly dark backdrop that he chose to make his YouTube channel, titled Wumscut86. He didn't post very often, only amassing five videos before the end, but the things he chose to upload were very telling. One of the first videos was him at a gun range, discharging a firearm downrange. 
a semi-automatic pistol, specifically a 22 Walther P-22 target. Adding into the fact that his favourite videos included footage from the Columbine school shooting, someone reported his YouTube channel concerned about his entirely legal access to a firearm and his rather odd interests. It was for this reason that the Finnish police paid him a visit on the 22nd of September 2008 to speak to him and make sure there was nothing amiss. They concluded that he was doing nothing wrong to the Finnish law at the time, since he had a temporary permit to hold the weapon in his possession and there were no further indications of criminal issues. They left the home satisfied that they had fulfilled their duty. The very next day, Marty would prove that conclusion tragically and brutally wrong. He returned to the Kahoyoki School of Hospitality in South Ostrobothnia. Before entering the school proper, he dropped off some notes which contained what would be described as his, quote, manifesto. They were a sprawling and rambling diatribe against the world and life in general. One of the key points in this document was that he had been intent on an action like this for, quote, years, and that he had held a deep-seated hatred for the human race in general. When he entered the facility itself, these intentions would become obvious. He opened fire in a classroom and began to indiscriminately take out students with the exact same pistol he had videos of himself shooting at the range with and had been reported for owning. After he had taken out as many as he could in that classroom, he spread flammable liquid around the room and lit it in an attempt to clear the remains of the victims. When law enforcement arrived and it was clear there was no way out, Marty did what most school shooters did. He was found by the police just after midday and transferred to the local hospital, where after more than four hours of intense medical intervention, he was declared dead. The death toll for his murderous rampage would later turn out to be 10 killed and 11 injured. Out of the 11 injuries, one woman had sustained a head wound, and out of the 10 dead, 8 were female and 2 were male. It's crazy to think that not only was Marty not the only YouTuber turned mass shooter, he wasn't even the only one from Finland, with Pekka Erik Alvinen of course having come before him. In the end, Marty was just another one of those natural selection freaks with an obsession for the Columbine shooters, something which is unfortunately still all too common to this day. And that's the end of the video folks. As always, I'm sorry about the time it took for the video to come out. This time it was mostly due to issues outside of my control. And my editor Chris was very sick for a while, meaning he wasn't able to work on the video. But he finally got it done and I personally think he did a terrific job and I hope you think the same. And I didn't forget that this video is going up very close to Christmas time. So I hope you all have a very happy Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or whichever holiday you celebrate at this time of year. Have fun, take care of yourselves, and be well. I'll see you all in 2024, where hopefully I'll get a video out that year. Thank you very much for watching, be sure to like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.